isn't going to be a, um, a case study. It won't be too much of a rant either, but it is going to differ from some of the papers that have gone earlier. In that I'm going to be looking at our interrelationship with the natural environment and natural environment professionals. And whilst I fully advocate working closely with them, and have been doing so for more than two decades, uh, they do present a bit of a problem. And we do need to admit this. I will also say that uh, some of the words that were said in the introductory session, when it was said that we need to be humble, I am going to say completely the opposite. We need to talk loudly, we need to acknowledge what we know, we need to ensure that other people understand that we know what we're talking about when it comes to the landscape. Um, but picking up on a previous point, that you can't make basically decent decisions unless you're informed, but you can't be informed if you don't listen. So, there are some issues. I don't believe in reading anything out on slides, so you have to do two things. You have to listen to me and you have to read the <laughs> slides at the same time. So my paper will examine the relationship of the natural environment and historic environment with regard to potential conflicts in managing landscape. The focus will be on the UK, but this is done in full cognizance of the wider international context within which UK landscape policies and practice have been formulated. Green infrastructure and ecosystem services are global concepts, and their application within the UK has been within a global framework. Pertinently and specifically, a European context, subject to European-derived agendas expressed through directives and conventions. So, before progressing, I need to present my credentials. What do I know about working with natural environment professionals? More importantly, I want to assure you that I'm not anti the natural environment profession, and certainly not anti the natural environment. I simply will point out a few of the challenges working in a policy and public perception context that is hugely tilted towards their profession rather than ours. Just look at what programs you can see on television. Full of cuddly pandas, far more than pictures of Phil Harding. I do fervently believe that we are better together, but within the Green Movement and as part of a wider international environmental community, both within the Green Movement and as part of a wider international environmental community. But after more than 25 years of attempted collaboration between the natural and historic environment sectors in the UK, large gulfs exist between us, both in terms of goals and policies. <coughs> there are still difficulties in working together that are not helped by mutual ignorance of each other's objectives and working methods. This is exemplified even in a field where you would expect understanding and integration. Landscape characterization, something we talked about a lot today. The national character areas were recently derived by Natural England, supposedly taking and integrating advice from historic landscape professionals. And yet they remain rooted in 1950s views of historical landscape development and 1950s grammar school history. They even managed to lose some of the historic environment underpinning of the old countryside commission's preceding joint character areas, which were derived in collaboration with archaeologists in the 1990s. I do know of what I'm speaking because I was one of the main archaeologists involved in advising the countryside commission. And as a county archaeologist, or and a, a later a county landscape manager, I um, was asked to advise on the national character areas. But whenever I reviewed the character areas that I'd supposedly advised on, I couldn't really see a lot of evidence that I'd ever said anything to them. <laughs> right, moving on. Okay. All Natural Things, published in 1992, and still very well worth reading, even though it existed in a completely different policy context to now. But if you've never read it, read it. It's a very good book. It was the first serious attempt to see the historic environment as part of a wider green agenda for the environment. But an agenda that was still at the stage of a debate, rather than a consensus. In it, Tom Greaves wrote, 
Environmentalists are much concerned about the abuse of creatures and plants that live or grow on land, and about the rapacious squandering of what is contained within its frame. Many understand the potential of archaeology to reveal information about past vegetation and climate, but few see the land as a human construct, full of cultural meaning and containing vital messages for the present day. Sadly, certainly the latter, latter part of this statement is still true today, and exemplified in the writings of environmental opinion formers such as George Monbiot, who will feature strongly in the remainder of this paper. <laughs> All natural things predated, predated the formulation of the concepts of GI, and screen infrastructure, and ecosystem services. And much of the rest of this paper will examine how engagement with these concepts may be one way of addressing the importance of the cultural dimension of today's environment. Indeed, without doing so, environmentalists are doomed to fail in their efforts to conserve the natural world and to adapt it to, rapidly, uh, cult to rapid culturally induced change. And the evidence is all around us of that. Just look at the decline in species in most of our lifetimes. Just look at the degradation of landscape in, during most of our lifetimes. They ain't doing a very good job. They're not winning. They are losing, and they're losing big time. And one of the main reasons why they're losing is the failure to engage with the cultural aspects of the landscape, both in terms of the needs of modern day societies, you only have to see what's happening in Africa to see that that's true, and in terms of past historic landscapes, and what that can help inform them about managing landscapes going forward. In fact, within many of our lives, the war may well be lost and over if things don't change. Okay, so there are many examples of books over the past 70 years that have dealt with aspects of the crossover between natural and historic environments. Indeed, clearly demonstrating that such a division is a wholly artificial one, but <coughs> not altogether helpful distinction. In my experience, whether written by historical geographers, biogeographers, or archaeologists, such tomes are primarily read by historic environment professionals, and not by our colleagues in the natural environment, who, when introduced to them, often find them quite revelatory. Right. We talked about ecosystem services and green infrastructure. Time for some definitions. <coughs> uh, I've highlighted in green the bits where we might link in. Where the, you know, this, I worked in a local authority for 11 years, so you spent your time perusing through documents, finding the one word that you might be able to connect with. <laughs> um, but essentially, um, those are the, the, the standard accepted definitions of the two things, and they're not altogether different. Uh, I've said on many occasions to natural environmental professionals that uh, green infrastructure is you know, ecosystem services for economists. Um, they've never agreed with me, but I still think they are. Um, there's not a lot of difference. They're both going in the same general direction. It's about what the environment can offer us. It's a very Western, it's a very capitalist way of looking at the environment, but that's the world in which we live. For now. Okay, so some current issues surrounding um, the, the, the historic environment and the natural environment. GI can be seen as, as I said, a Western, capitalist, and culturally biased way of managing natural resources and phenomena. It is a much bigger deal in places such as South Korea and the United States than it is in the UK. It offers both challenges and opportunities for the stock environment. Because GI is firmly cultural in outlook, its practitioners are often sympathetic to the historic environment component of their environment. Where, where a heritage asset or area of historic landscape is seen as a GI asset, however, the historic environment's intellectual and recreational societal values are seen as only part of the multifunctionality of a GI asset. This is the buzz word, multifunctionality. <coughs> and by no means are these um, values of the historic environment accorded precedence in the future management of such an asset. For the most part, however, beyond flood prevention, 
UK policymakers are not greatly engaging in GI, especially since 2010 when local authority funding began to seriously contract because most green infrastructure engagement in the UK had been at a local authority level rather than at a national level. In fact, there are some statements from a number of governments which uh, fairly well derided the concept of GI. Ecosystem services, on the other hand, is well up on the agenda in the UK. Its approaches to land management, however, are woven throughout government land use strategies and policies. And the remainder of this paper will concentrate on a couple of aspects of these. Rewilding and woodland extension, especially as it may influence the British uplands. And this is where I hope my paper will link in a bit with Francesco's. Both of these issues are being considered in Britain as part of a wider European approach to landscape management. And of course, may, the game may change a little in the next few years. Right. Now, post-Brexit, I guess we could ignore this now. Um, but, but we're going to use it for now. So, this is a study um, in looking at rewilding in Europe that is focusing on the levels of expected farmland abandonment. So these green bits are areas of what they consider to be farmland abandonment, and these bits are areas of urbanisation. Well, it automatically makes me somewhat suspicious of the plan because they clearly have no idea of what the planned extension for housing in the West Midlands is likely to be. <laughs> Never mind. <clears throat> However, working on this basis, um, much of the rewilding issue is focused on land becoming redundant. And much of the land that is likely to become redundant farmland is considered to be irrelevant. <coughs> Clearly, they didn't have a very good GIS system because I don't see the Lower Eden Valley in Cumbria being abandoned any time soon, whereas the Scottish borders are currently and experiencing abandonment. Never mind. <coughs> okay, so let's look at Biwali. Please read the quote. There are many elements of George Monbiot's writing in The Guardian which uh, are guaranteed to cause me to start a mini political chunter uh, at my poor wife, um, who's had to put up with many of these. Um, there are some that make me nearly apoplectic, but there we go. So, new establishment of the organisation Be Wilding Britain, inspired by his book, not the arrogance of the man. <laughs> but he's nothing to do with it. No, because he has no expertise whatsoever. However, he is very influential. Very, very influential in the environmental movement. I have heard people who I work with, environmental professionals, um, one of the heads, for example, of uh, Cumbria Wildlife Trust, who has spouted Monbiot almost word for word, particularly in his aim to reclothe the British uplands with the trees that they all had until they were destroyed by the nasty iron masters um, from the end of the uh, Middle Ages. He doesn't even have grammar school 1950s history. But never mind. So, rewarding the uplands. Now, what is wrong with this statement? Well, there's a number of things that are wrong with the statement, but we'll concentrate on that middle paragraph. Our bare hills are not at the three principal activities, sheep farming, deer stalking, and grouse shooting. Really? Well, let's start with grouse shooting. In order to raise grouse, what's the one thing you need? Cover. Woodland cover. Natural England, in fact, is sponsoring schemes in the Cumbrian uplands. If you've ever driven through Cumbria, you've probably driven on the M6, it's the main road through it. Most people go on that road. You go through a lovely area called Tea Bay Gorge. Nowadays, well, as of uh, just a few months ago, it's the Yorkshire Dales on one side, it's the Lake District on the other side, as both the parks extended to meet the motorway. <coughs> when you look at the Yorkshire Dales side, that's the so-called Howgill Hills. 
fact, they're actually the Langdale Fells, but never mind, they're now called the Howgill Hills. Um, and uh, you will see that there are various areas of newly planted woodland. That woodland has been planted for two reasons. One, as cover for a to increase the grouse legs. In fact, there isn't a grouse leg anywhere near there. The nearest one is 25 miles away, but eventually the grouse might get there. So it might encourage a new grouse leg. The other reason why it's there is for sheep farming. Because guess what? It's common land. The, the flocks have reduced in size. The shepherds get fed up and chase them around on their quad bikes. They want to narrow down the areas. So they narrow down the areas by having woodland. Now, it's not because the woodland is woodland that it narrows down the areas, it's because it's allowed to be fenced for 14 years in order to stop browsing. And it's the fences, it's the only way you'll get fences on commons, is if it's the new areas of woodland. Um, but both <coughs> sheep farming and grouse are actually encouraging woodland in that area. Um, deer stalking in Scotland? Mm. Ever been to a deer estate in Scotland? Most of them are full of woodland. In fact, it makes it a bit more sporting. Anyone can shoot a stag out on the moorland. It's a bit more difficult if you're in woodland place. Anyway, they're not the reason for why uh, the hills are bare. There's also an assumption behind a lot of obvious writers and those who follow them that it is relatively recent. It isn't. We as archaeologists know that. We damn well know that the uplands are not recently bare. There's also a few other issues with this whole idea. It um, reduces, for example, the importance of the landscape we've got up there, moorland. Yeah, we don't have a lot of woodland in comparison to the rest of Europe, but guess what? About 90% of the world's moorland, and it's rather important in its own ecological way, including as a carbon capture. Okay, now, that's one view. This is another view. Uh, James Rebanks um, has done very well out of this book that he's written on being a shepherd in Matadown. But James is, uh, isn't just a shepherd. He's also an economist. He's also a graduate historian. And he's also an advisor to UNESCO. And strongly involved in the recent uh, bid by the Lake District to become a World Heritage Site. I'll take his knowledge on sheep farming any day, but what he shows, and what he showed in writing a report on green infrastructure for Cumbria County Council, which I commissioned about seven years ago, a bit longer than that, nine years ago, uh, was that the farmers and the generations of farmers are clearly the people who created this landscape beyond the geological processes. And you can see in the Lake District, it goes all the way back into the Bronze Age. We know this. We've taken paleo environmental cores all across the Lake District, and we know that they've been there for a very long time. Are they ecological deserts? Which is another thing that George Monbiot points out. Actually, some of the hills in the north of England are. Again, going back to the Hellgill Hills, they are an ecological desert. But it's the way the farming has been done. It's to do with supplementary feeding, it's to do with how you've managed the grass over a number of generations. But other parts of the Lake District, Matadale, for example, are wonderful, both terms archaeologically and ecologically. Okay. Woodland extensions. This is another little bit of influential Natural environment lobbying. Well, I won't even tell you about the inaccuracies on them. I'll put them up there. You know, there's fake news and downright lies. And this is full of it. Um, map there shows some of the areas for woodland extension. Some of it we all know is happening. It's been happening in the Midlands, for example. And it's not necessarily a bad idea. And many of these projects do come with archaeological coverage. The archaeological <laughs> sites that are there are taken into account. We, no we number the sites, we uh, show where they are, but we don't really take into account the nature of the historic landscape and how that might inform where woodland could be extended. 
Now that is being done and there's a project that's being done by Newcastle University um, working with the Forestry Commission that is actually looking at potential for woodland extension. And you find when you do it, you examine it, that actually the best places to extend woodland, because you don't want to take up your best agricultural land, uh, but the places to extend woodland are often those places that were wooded in the Middle Ages. Fancy that. Um, but in fairness, the Forestry Commission is a very good part of the natural environment. I've worked with them for years, and they really do take the historic environment into account. Right, some shared concerns then. How can we go forward? Well, we have a number of shared concerns. Flooding, uh, the other one is coastal erosion. What you can see eroding out there at Silverdale in Lancashire is uh, something that's always referred to as a copper smelter. It's not. It's a, a copper mine, and it's its air shaft. Um, there are issues that we share in terms of uh, peatlands and wetlands, and wetlands drying out, and the drainage of wetlands. A uh, particular example here, all taken from a website, um, but it's a very good example of one of our most famous sites, Darkar. And here we clearly have a clear alliance, an alignment with the natural environment. We do not want to see the wetlands becoming desiccated. We don't. We support things like rip blocking up in the wetland, uh, up in the up in the peatland areas. We don't want to see the carbon escaping either. Some other examples. Hay meadows. Sorry for the use of the word traditional. Right? Uh, traditional meaning, as in at least since the 17th century, but who knows earlier. Um, yes. We want to see hay meadows retained, so does the natural environment. We want to see areas of woodland pasture retained, as does the natural environment. And there's a lot of work being done by both people from the historic environment and natural environment on ensuring this, particularly within natural parks and other protected landscapes. So what's the way forward? This map, which is taken from my wife's thesis, which she kindly let me uh, use, uh, maps uh, ancient woodland against areas that can be proven as having been wooded at least into the 16th century um, and may be an indicative of least late <coughs> medieval woodland and you can see some interesting coincidences and those are areas that I would suggest are very good for future woodland extension and you're extending from ancient woodland areas often gill woodlands um, and that's great you know, that fits in with uh, the historic character of the landscape. It fits in with the natural environment. Looking at green infrastructure. Well, we link into this in a number of different ways. And um, there are a number of things on there that I'm sure you can look at and you can say yes straight away. Oh, yes, obviously. So, historic environment. It's not included as one of the multiple benefits of GI, but it contributes significantly to the multifunctionality of GI assets, to outdoors activity, linked to health and well-being, conservation and retention of the familiar, which contributes to mental health. Interesting report, one of the very last reports the Labour government did um, before the uh, Cameron's government came in in 2010 was about new developments and the impact they have on people's mental health. Very negative impact. Within two weeks, they've only been out for two weeks, but within two weeks of the uh, Cameron's government coming in, that report has been sat on. No longer appeared on the website because nobody wanted to report to say, you know what? Actually, some of these new developments we should be saying, no, it's not good for the people who live there. They've got a point when they don't like them. Anyway, there we go. Um, recreation, education, tourism. We can see how we fit into those. So, I mentioned the common international classification of ecosystem services before. Well, how does it define cultural ecosystem services? Well, it defines them as physical, intellectual, spiritual, symbolic, and other interactions with biota, ecosystems, and land seascapes. So, clearly, such interactions are not simply enshrined in the human response to places, spaces, and elements of the biosphere, but they're embedded in the material culture created during these interactions, including throughout anthropogenic modification of the landscape. Again, 
You know, we're well fitted into ecosystem services. Not a problem there. It is something that we should be using. Okay, things to be done. I will go through this one. So historic environment professionals need to understand and engage with ecosystem services and GI approaches to landscape management. Well, they certainly do in local authorities. They don't have much choice. And um, yeah, to an extent, in national agencies as well. In the commercial sector, no. Nah. Uh, most people in the commercial sector, it's meaningless gibberish. Ecosystem services and GI approaches to land management and their relevance to historic environment protection should be taught on university archaeological courses. I'll try and convince you of that one, sir. Cultural elements of ecosystem services needs to be better understood within those, within those organisations influencing land management decision making, especially local planning authorities. Yes, it does. I mean, let's be honest, the average local councillor goes ecosystem services, blah de blah de blah, doesn't understand the word they said. They certainly are not going to understand the cultural dimension of it, because the only bit that's going is eco, that's green, isn't it? That's natural, isn't it? Come on, there's a number of you who've worked in local authorities, as have I. They're not the brightest, are they? <laughs> Ignorance of the historic environment, whether in natural England or in the pages of the Guardian, needs to be challenged. Yes, it damn well does. We need to stop them. Oh, we've got to be nice. Come on, we mustn't upset. We've got to be humble. No! <laughs> Write in. Tell George Monbiot is an idiot. They may not punch it, but you'll feel better afterwards. <laughs> Personal experience, though. <laughs> the ecosystems improvement initiatives need to not only take account of heritage assets, but to be fully informed by deeper understanding the historic environment. And that's where we are, I think, with Natural England and, and to some extent with the Forestry Commission. It's not just about the heritage assets. We can help you. We really can. We have something to say here. That's it. Well, that's the end message. Thank you for listening.